Okay. <laughs> it is Wednesday afternoon, May 29th. We're picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 41. And uh, we'll be at verse 45 with our new material. I'm not sure which is going to end first Genesis or our next <laughs> few months, <laughs> but we're coming. And we'll be moving a little more rapidly through the story part of the book. But uh, very interesting, very rich what we're coming into. We're looking into the time now that Yosef is being raised up from the pit to the palace. Isn't it amazing? In a matter of hours, he went from literally being in the pit, coming out, being cleaned up real quick, put before Pharaoh, and he puts him second whip in charge just right behind him. And he did that because he saw the Spirit of God in him. Yosef was able to determine, well, to tell him his dream and ex explain what it meant. The wisdom that he showed in that, Pharaoh wanted him in charge of Egypt because the dream showed Pharaoh there was going to be seven good years and there was going to be seven years of famine. And uh, we have an interruption coming in. <laughs> Shalom, it's open, it's open. Shalom. <laughs> For any who don't know, this is Pastor Carl. <laughs> Are you joining her? Even though it's brown, it might as well be black. That's, she, she sees big and black and she marks. Shadow, shadow, shadow. You can find them now. Yeah. Um, and you can do black hat. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Roger, if you want to go put the, the single crook in there for him. Oh, sure. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to cut this. I'm going to start us again so Roger can just cut all that off. I'll say it faster though, okay? So, um, and I'll give three second pause again if he's not there. Hey, stop. Shh. Shadow. Shadow. She will settle down. <laughs> well, she's going to go hide with the girls. <laughs> Okay, it's Wednesday afternoon. It's May 29th. We're picking up in Bereshit, chapter 41 of Genesis, and about verse 45, reviewing from 38 on. In just a matter of hours, Yosef went from the pit to the palace. He's been able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, the dream showing seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. In the explanation he gave, he showed such wisdom. Pharaoh said, can we find a man such as this in all of Egypt who has the spirit of God in him? First time it's been referenced that way in our scriptures. And he sees that wisdom and wants to put Yosef in charge. So we see him brought up right under to second under power of Pharaoh. He is given new clothing the gold chain, he has the signet ring, which means it's law. In fact, people aren't going to be able to even get food without going through Pharaoh, or, uh, through Yosef, I'm sorry, we're going to see that. Everyone was to bow the knee and do homage to Yosef. The only one who would not would be Pharaoh himself. With all of that already being said, then as we come into our new material, in verse 45, we have that Pharaoh is going to give a new name to Yosef. Now, I will slaughter it, I'm sure. <laughs> Even looking at it in my Hebrew, the text doesn't help a whole lot. The Hebrew, I will say, is, is soft not, panach, and in the English, and believe me, I'm, I'm trying, I'm struggling, folks, but in the English, it looks like, and I've lost it, there it is, Zephanoth Pania. Okay, just a guess. If you pronounce it differently, that's fine. But what we're told from our rabbis is that the translation, it was a Coptic name. Coptic comes from the Egyptian world. And we're told that it means revealer <coughs> of secrets. So revealer very, of secrets? Secrets. Revealer. revealer. Oh. Yeah, because he revealed the dream. Oh. So he's a revealer of secrets. Mm -hmm. Now, in Egyptian, the name might have meant the sustenance <coughs> of the land is the living one. And in other words, to put it in simple English, the idea is that Yosef is the savior of the land of Egypt. And that's what this new name is reflecting. Why do I bring it out when it's Egyptian and Coptic? Because once again, we see the relationship, the typology of Yosef and Yeshua, Jesus. Go with me to Philippians 2, 9 and 10. And in Philippians 2... Verse 9, and you might put a 
uh, bookmark in here, or I think we're going back to these verses several times. Starting with verse 9, this time for this reason also, God highly exalted him, speaking of Yeshua Jesus, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Yeshua, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And I can hardly wait to see this whole world bow to the one that I love. Um, let me show you also the, the similarity in their names and the meanings in the Savior because we also see that relation in Matthew 1. So on your way back to Genesis, stop off at Matthew, Mattathiah, Matthew 1 and verse 21. And of course, this is the genealogy that leads to the birth of Yeshua. And here in verse 21, it says, She will bear a son. My version has a capital S, and rightly so, because he's the son of God that is, is being born in human flesh. You shall call his name Jesus, or you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. That's basically uh, the difference Yeshua is saving from sin Yosef was saving the land from famine, but we see the comparison of getting the new name. I forgot to stop you off at Acts. You can go back to Acts with me if you want, or just listen. Acts chapter 5 and verse 31. Probably a familiar verse to many of you, but I will read it anyway. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I love it because especially in there where you see him called Prince, it reminds me of Yeshahu, Isaiah 9 and verse 6, where he is called the Prince of Peace. Prince means a ruler. It doesn't mean an underdog. It you know, doesn't mean that he's a lower position, a princely position, a rulership position. And Yeshua in rulership will save the, the world, all those who will come to him. Um, for, for forgiveness of their sins. So very much you see the similarity of the meaning of the names. Uh, that's number 63, if I didn't say it, for our typology of the comparison of Yosef and Jesus. Now, with Yosef being given Egyptian citizenship, being given that social status, it's going to make it easier for the people to accept him as the second in the land. They're going to just fall right into place with that. So in essence, Yosef becomes this, I'm going to say ZP. I can just use the initials, this new name, okay? And we look at Yeshua, and Yeshua really had two names also. A lot of people in our day and age mistake it because we have first and last names. So they look at Yeshua's name as first and last. And if you don't know what I'm referring to, I'm referring to Jesus Christ. And you will hear that all the time. Oh, that's his first name and his last name. No, it's not. He would have been called Yeshua Ben, and then if it was his earthly father, Yosef. Jesus, son of Joseph. That's the way they did their names. They didn't have a, a family surname as we do now. They were always the son of, and they would name the father because it was the line through the father that was what was of importance. So why does he have two names? It's talking about his positions, his uh, authority, his rulership, his, there's a better word for it, and I'm fighting for that word. It'll come to me in a minute, but let me say Yeshua means God saves. It's off of the Old Testament, I call original covenant, Yahshua, Joshua, God saves. Okay, so in this name, we're being told he is the Savior. Then Christ, and by the way, I should say, that's the Son of Man. He came into being human so that he might save us, and he could do that because he was Son of God. So it's the capital S. Son of Man is a very Messianic title. It means that Messiah is deity, fully God and fully man. That's all in the name Yeshua. Then in the name Christ, you have the Anointed One. And that also is positionship, it's what he is doing, who he is. It's the, the English is Christ, the Hebrew is Mashiach, it's translated as the anointed one. God put his anointing on Yeshua in that human form. We saw even in the baptism, remember we talked about his baptism? He was not going into the waters of baptism for forgiveness of sin, or a picture of that because he had no sin. He was going through the ritual cleansing to step into the high priestly role, and the Father in heaven, pleased with his son, shows by the Spirit, which is a, p a picture of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and even Yeshua said, his Spirit is on me. 
in this day this has been fulfilled in your presence was what he said in Luke 4 when he was uh, talking to the, the synagogue of Nazareth and he was quoting Yeshayahu, Isaiah, the part of scripture, the, the Hoftor as it's called, that they were reading that week. Just coincidentally reading when it talked about the one who would come, who would give sight to the blind and who would, it, it gives many descriptions and saving them from their sins and that's the favorable year of the Lord. Go read Luke 4, starting with verse 16 through about 19, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, because it shows them in this role. It shows it very clearly. And they just happened to be reading that part when they gave Yeshua the scroll to read that day. Now, we know God ordained that timing. It was not accidental. But they didn't realize, and the great prophecy in it is that he stopped with and the favorable year of the Lord, that this is this is what's happening right now, it's being fulfilled. But if you go read it in Isaiah, there was one more phrase. It talks about the vengeance of the day of vengeance of God. That's the tribulation period, that's what's coming, and his stopping right there showed. This part's been fulfilled. This part's still to come. In one verse, quoting Yeshahu, Isaiah, we see the first and the second coming with a time period in between. So when our Jewish people say, well, it never tells us that Messiah is going to come twice. Oh, yes it does. <laughs> yes it does. Here's one proof and there are more. So, what chapter that is? Isaiah? Isaiah, um, he's quoting Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And in Luke, it's Luke um, 4, starting with what? verse 16. Luke 4? Oh, look. Luke, yeah. Luke 4, starting with verse 16. Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. And we just did that last week, so perfect timing. You're on the Jewish calendar, what they're reading and studying right now. Yeah. Just happened to come out in our class today. Isn't that amazing timing too? <laughs> but back on track here, we have that now that he has two names. The anointed of God and the God saves are the two names, Yeshua and Mashiach. Jesus Christ in our English that we have. So Yosef had two names, Yeshua has two names. We'll call that number 64 in our typology of comparing the two in their earthly life here. So he gets himself a wife. And this is good, folks. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. But uh, going back to Genesis 41, we see that Yosef has been given these other blessings uh, as he comes into that rulership, but he also, um, in verse 45, and I'm back there, he gave him, and again, I probably am not pronouncing it correctly, uh, it looks like Asanath, I can't even do it in my English, um, and in our Hebrew it's easier, Oznot, or Oznot, okay, so I'll stick with the Hebrew on this one. Um, but she is a Gentile wife, obviously, she's got a, a good Egyptian name, she's not Jewish, Yosef has been given a Gentile wife while he is rejected by his brethren. Remember, his brethren have sold him off to slavery. They have no part with him, and he's getting himself a Gentile wife. I love seeing the light go on. Number 65, okay, in the comparison, it is the type of the church. The church is the bride of Christ, and during Israel's rejection as a whole, as a nation, not all individuals, but as a whole, as the nation, when she is, is uh, distancing, rejecting herself from him, he is exalted, just as Yosef was exalted. He comes in that position of highest dignity when he returns. He has been exalted. He came and was made a little lower than the angels, but now he has been lifted on high. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's waiting in the wings, so to speak, and he will come back as ruler. He will come back in dignity. He'll come back like Yosef as ruler. So we see the comparison in it that fits perfectly. During this time, he gets the Gentile bride. Okay? Keep that in mind. We'll talk more about that. I love this chapter. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 24 to 36 rapidly. I won't go into all detail. We start with, but God raised him again, or raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. We're talking about God raising Yeshua from the dead. He could not stay dead. The power of God resurrects him 
and he had been promised he would not see corruption. His body would not decay. God raised him. Verse 25 says, for David, David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Where's What right hand is the Savior that's going to keep David from shaking? Who is that? That's Yeshua Jesus. Yeah. David had the four... four um, well, foreknowledge, I'll put it that way. Foresight to see Yeshua in that raised position. He saw him in that. Therefore, my heart was glad. My tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. So while David has looked and seen the Messiah, the risen Yeshua, he also recognizes the human Yeshua who will be on this earth, who will not be abandoned when he goes into the heart of the earth for three days. He'll be brought out before the body would decay because decay took place on the fourth day. He's resurrected on the third day and he will not see that decay. That was a fulfillment of Psalm uh, 16 where it said that, that God would not allow his Holy One, who is Yeshua, to see decay. Here we're, we're having the quote of it. Um, and let me go on because we're also quoting from another Psalm. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make full of gladness with your, you'll make me full of gladness with your presence. So David seeing the whole work of Messiah, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his exaltation, and he's excited about it. It, it blesses his spirit even as it does us today. And uh, in Acts here, he goes on and says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, okay, was David talking about himself? He both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. That's what's being said here in Acts in the, the early first century. But I'll tell you, in the 20th century, I stood at David's tomb. He's still got a tomb. He's still got a place today that, that's marked. The body is, is dust, but we know that that's where he was buried. Um, verse 30, and so because he was a prophet, knew that God had sworn to him with an oath, to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Again, he's declaring the resurrection happened. He's telling it live to the people. I mean, this the living testimony of Peter at this time, of uh, Kepha, of uh, Paul that will come soon is amazing what was coming out, what was being told. But at this time, with this, the time of this resurrection, there were people alive who went through the crucifixion and the resurrection. They could have called him out if he was lying. They could have said, no, you know, we know where his body is buried. And instead, there were others who backed up what he said. We saw the resurrected Christ. We saw the resurrected Christ. So it's strong, strong testimony here. Beautiful fulfillment, again, of Tehillim, Psalm uh, 16. Verse 32 in Acts. This Yeshua Jesus, God raised him up again, to which we are all witnesses. He's telling that the others, like him, who are eyewitnesses to this. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was, let me stop there and say, okay, so now he's saying, we've seen him, he raised he ascended, and the Holy Spirit has come, and that's what you're seeing in evidence today. In evidence in when they saw the, the tongues of fire landing on the, those in the upper room, when they were able to speak in languages, telling the gospel. It was not unknown languages. It was languages to the people. All of them up there for Shavuot were coming to that very same time on our Jewish calendar in just, what, a week and a half from now? A uh, week from now? Anyway, uh, my point being, they were eyewitnesses to all this, and he's calling it out and he's declaring it. If you took this kind of eyewitness into the courts today, you'd win your case. Eyewitnesses win cases. Here's all the proof that we need. And he's declaring it, and he's declaring here that in this power, it's not talking about David. Verse 34, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but David himself said, and he quotes now Psalm 110, starting with verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, Jehovah said to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So 
now he's given the whole crescendo. He was here, he lived an earthly life, he was buried, he rose, he walked among us, we saw him, he, uh, he ascended, I'm sorry, into heaven, he's waiting at the right hand of the Father, he's going to come back to rule and reign. It's all been given, the whole thing's been given here. Wow, what a crescendo and fulfilling all these scriptures. And that's why he closes it, closes it off saying, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God, Elohim, Jehovah God, has made him both Lord, Adonai, and Messiah, Mashiach, Lord and Christ, this Yeshua, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Mm -hmm. You thought you ended it by putting him to death. Hello, he's not dead. He rose. He is God saves Yeshua. He is Mashiach, the anointed one. In his role, he will come back ruling and reigning. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. What a scripture. I love it. <laughs> All of that in the two names. Is that not amazing? Mm -hmm. And now we go back into Yosef having these two names. And we're seeing again, and I forgot, let me follow that thought through. When he uh, comes back in that second coming, his Gentile bride comes with him. Mm -hmm. It's not the time that he receives her. He's gotten her. He comes back with her at that time when he's going to come back in that exalted position and rule and reign. How do I know that we're that part? Because for us, we're told in Romans 8, verse 17, and I will read it for you so you know it's God's word and not Rochelle's. Uh, it's, uh, Romans 8 and verse 17. And if children, if we're children of God, heirs also, that's H-E-I-R-S. Shadow, shadow. Heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Messiah, with Mashiach, with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we may also be glorified with him. So your present suffering you're going through will not be your eternal state. You'll come to that time that you're going to be glorified and with him. You're going to be entering into, an heir is one who receives the, the values of, that belong to that family. They're passed down. Yeshua shares his riches with us because we're his bride. We're his family. And let me show you Revelation 5.10. Revelation 5 and verse 10. Roger. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Revelation 5 and verse 10. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Amen. We will come back to rule and to reign with Messiah when he is sitting on his earthly throne for the millennium. And this is, is that completion of that picture. So... This bride that Yosef is getting, because we're going back to Genesis 41, this bride that he is getting is a Gentile. She comes out of the heathen nations. She didn't know the God of Israel, but she's united with him, not when he's in the pit, not when he's seeing, we see him in a picture of death. She's united with him in his dignity and his glory. Yosef is ruler when his wife comes to him. And the church will be, or the called out assembly, will be intimately associated with our Messiah, with Yeshua Jesus, with Christ, whatever name you're comfortable with, in his glory, as was Yosef's wife. We're not going into the grave with him. We'll be in seeing him in his rulership position, and that's when we'll be united in that position with him. That we see also in Revelation 19. Let me take you, whoops. Let me take you there real quickly. Revelation 19, verses 7 to 9. Revelation 19, starting with verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb. Here's the bride. The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. We put on the righteous robe of Messiah. That's how we're looked on as righteous by God, not because of our works, but because we wear his robe of righteousness. And in verse 9, he says, And he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Do I want verse 10? No, I'll stop there. Okay, I could go on, but then I'll get off and want to tell you all about those verses. So, we got a marriage supper. We're not the invited. We're the bride. 
we're going to come to those on the millennial earth who are invited to the wedding to or to the marriage supper of, of the lamb the wedding's already taken place so again beautiful beautiful picture of uh, portrayal for us in this back in Genesis in bear sheet did I in in verse sorry I'll tell you in a minute I think we're Right Thank now. you. We are still in 45. So he's he's given us not as as or I may be not saying it right in Hebrew either. But anyway, that name it comes from um, the Egyptian goddess. the The name of the goddess I'm going to spell it for you. N as in nut. <laughs> okay. N e i t h. Neith. Neith. I'm not sure how to say it. Um, the goddess of wisdom was known as Minerva, and this is the Egyptian equivalent to the goddess of wisdom known as Minerva. So obviously she comes from a family that was steeped in heathendom. They worshipped the god, goddess Minerva, which was supposed to be for wisdom. But I'll show you the difference that comes in for her, what we believe, that we see in scripture in a moment. Let me tell you that she was um, the daughter of Potiphar the priest of On, or On, whichever way I should say it, and she's given as his wife. Now, On, or On, that was a city of Egyptian science, Egyptian culture. It was the religious capital. It was about 7 to 10 miles north of Cairo. It was the center of sun worship, and the sun god Ra, some say Ra, R E, but usually it's Ra in the literature that you'll read. This is where that worship came from, one of the oldest known worships of the sun god um, it's the modern heliopolis that's the greek name given to the area today meaning city of the sun and they worship the sun there potiphar means the same thing as potiphar and it means given by ra sun god so she in their mind the sun god ra gave her to the world and now she's been given to yosef so she was probably very much involved in the worship of the sun that's the background, okay? Priest of On tells us the position of the family, that he was powerful, he was closely identified with the throne. He would have been known like uh, the chief priest of On, the, the head of it is, is another way we could put it. So she's been brought up in heathendom. There was a closeness to the throne. That's probably why she was chosen to be in that position. But notice what she's going to name her children along with Yosef. She's not going to give them Egyptian names. She's not going to give them heathen names. She's going to give them names that are Hebrew and that reflect what's going on in Yosef's life. So it's highly believed that she came into believing in the God of Yosef. And she loved him. <laughs> she loved him. And I can't see it any other way for one who is such, such a picture of one so close to God. He could not be in a relationship with the one who is in heathendom. So I believe that she cut off that, came into fully under Yosef, learned about the true God of Israel, and came to believe in him. So when we get to the names of the children, I'll back up what I'm saying. Can I tell you this dogmatically? No. But it seems to be that way from what we would understand and from the Hebrew names and all. It just seems that, you know, that's the conclusion we would come to. Okay. Excuse me. So verse 46, Yosef was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. Here's number 66 in our comparison between Yeshua and Yosef because they both began that ministry, that public ministry, when they were 30 years of age. I'll back it up with Luke 3 and verse 23 to show you where I get it about Yeshua. Here's, of course, where we get it about Yosef. Luke 3 and verse 23 When he began his ministry, Yeshua, Jesus himself, was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Yosef, that's a different Yosef, not, not our original covenant Joseph, but our New Testament Joseph, the son of Eli, okay? And it goes on, the son of Method, the Levi, Melchi, it goes on and gives the a genealogy there. But point being for right now is they were both 30 when they went into public ministry. Now, Yosef had been in Egypt about 13 years. He spent the last three of that in prison, okay? He, about this time, we know from timeline that this is when Yitzhak, Isaac, dies, okay? About the time that Yosef's coming to the throne. 
Now Isaac, Yitzhak, is Israel, representing Israel. And Israel is set aside or cut off when Yosef is exalted. We don't see Yosef being exalted as a Jewish ruler. We see him being exalted as an Egyptian. You're going to see he puts on the appearance of Egyptian and he's running the country of Egypt. He's not running the country of Israel. So in that sense, we see a setting aside of Israel while this is going on. It doesn't mean an end. It doesn't mean cut off and finished, not by any stretch of the imagination. Stay with me and you will see. But this is the time that Joseph is exalted in the Egyptian world. Interesting is David, David, was also 30 years old when he became king. That's 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel and chapter 5, it's 2 Shmuel, if you want it in the Hebrew, chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 4. <laughs> David, David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. So from 30 to 70, David was king over Israel. Now, the priests entered into Levitical service at the age of 30. Go with me to Bedmid Bar, that's Numbers chapter 4. Numbers chapter 4, Bad Midbar in Hebrew, Numbers 24, and we'll look at verse 23, and then we'll drop down. Verse 23 tells us, from 30 years and upward to 50 years old, you shall number them all who enter to perform the service to do work in the tent of the meeting. Tent of the meeting was a tabernacle. So if they were going to go into service in the tabernacle, they would be 30 years old, and they would serve till they were 50 years old and then they would be retired out, so to speak. Verses 46 and 47, we have all the numbered men of the Levites, whom Moshe and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, and the leaders of Israel numbered by their families and by their father's households. Verse 47, from 30 years and upward, even to 50 years, everyone who could enter to do the work of service and the work of carrying on in the tent of the meeting. So there you go, your priests entered into Levitical service at age 30, David becomes king at age 30, Yosef and Yeshua are in their public ministries at age 30. Now is it not interesting that Yeshua is in the role of king and priest? Mm -hmm. We see him as both. One of my favorite verses, this is Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 13. Zechariah 6 and verse 13. I usually read 12 and 13 together, but for in 12 it tells us it's the branch who will spring forth. Those of you who are around me know one of our ministry names is Samak, means the branch that springs forth and fills the face of the earth. And then here's verse 13, uh, yes, I'm sorry, verse 13. Uh, talking about him, it says that this branch, yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Gil's not normally here today, and he's our perfect example. Come show the camera. He's wearing Samak on the hat and on the shirt. <laughs> so if you can see, well, you got the shirt emblem. He, the hat, you got a duck. <laughs> Look on the screen, and then you can see yourself. There you go. There it is. <laughs> okay. So perfect. And wearing the kingly crown. So that's the Samoth name. The righteous ruler. Thank you for the object lesson, Pastor Gil. That was perfect. Um, back in verse 13. I lost my place there. Okay. So I'll start again. He'll build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne and the council of Shalom, a peace will be between the two offices. So we see him kingly and we see him priestly. He is king and priest. He's the only one that is prophet, priest, and king. We're seeing him in two of his roles here right now. And these two are reflected along with Yosef in our comparison. When uh, Yosef is 30 years old, in verse 46, that's when he stood in the presence of Pharaoh or he stood before Pharaoh. He's taking possession of that office and he's going to be sent out on mission by Pharaoh. And there's number 67. Yeshua Jesus was sent forth on a mission by his father. Let me show you that. It's his words in Yochanan, John 17. And we will read in John 17, verse 18. I'm sorry. Yochanan, John. I'm sorry. Did you say 65 or 67? 67. 
Okay, then I missed something. So I had 63, 64, now I'm going 65. Did I miss a number? Yeah. 63 is getting the new name. 64 is the two names, okay. Yeshua and, and Messiah. And then 65, he gets his bride, okay. the, the, the um, called out assembly. And 66, they're both 30 years old. 66 and, is 30, okay. Yes. And then 67, they're both sent out on mission by the one, you know, by the father, quote. Yes, Pharaoh isn't the father, but Pharaoh sends Yosef out on mission. The father, Jehovah, sends Yeshua out on mission. Yochanan, John 17 and verse 18, where Yeshua says, As you, speaking to his father, sent me, Yeshua, into the world, I have sent them into the world. So God sent Yeshua in on mission. Yeshua sends his his Talmudim disciples out on mission. Okay, he sends out the 70. At one point, we know what he did with his, well, it ends up being 11, but his 12 in the beginning. So that's number 67 to be followed by number 68 that we see that they went throughout all the land. This was also spoken of, of Yeshua when we read in Matthew 4, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew 4 and verse 23. Matthew 4, 23, Yeshua Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So he went out throughout the land. Um, let me show you also chapter 9 of Matthew because this is following his earthly life. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 sounds almost the same, but we're a number of episodes later in his life. Yeshua, Jesus, was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So Yeshua went out through Galilee, then he went out further than Galilee. He's going throughout all the cities. And now as we remember that, we're going to go back and we're going to see Yosef is going to go throughout all the cities. He's going to go throughout all of his territory, so to speak. But in the same way, we see that comparison. Pharaoh said to Yosef in verse 41, back in chapter 41, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh, oh, I backed up, I went back too far. I'm sorry. It should have been, I should have been in verse 47. I'm sorry. I think that's my eyeballs. <laughs> okay, yeah, verse 46, he's 30, he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and Yosef went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went out throughout all the land of Egypt. So they both went out throughout their land, okay? Now, verse 47, I'm ready for it. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. Okay, Yosef is exalted, and there's a season of plenty. That's like a picture of the age of God's grace. There's plenty of grace sufficient right now. And during this time, it says that the, the land brought forth abundantly, or you may have that it produced abundantly, or produced by handfuls. The idea is that it was abundant, that they all had full hands, they had full crops, they were bringing in all, all that they, they needed. They had a great amount of food, okay? Now, Yosef has gone out to see what's going on through the land. He's acquiring firsthand knowledge of the resources, first-hand knowledge of the people through surveying, okay? He's, he's surveying it. He's seeing it with his own eyes. His training in Potiphar's house when he was overseer and even the time when he was in prison has trained him for this. So he knows what he's looking for. He knows what he's looking at. He can spy out those who be good leaders. He can see where he needs to set things up. He's got a plan going, and this is what he's doing. So for approximately 10 years between slave and prison, uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying, when he was, became a, a captive in prison, the training he went through in those 10 years is all paying off now. And I said to encourage you today, you may think, why am I in this? But as my dad used to like to say, future tra uh, present training yes. for future reigning. Yeah. And that's what we see in Yosef's life. God was training him and using that time for what was going to come for him very quickly. So it put him in good stead. He's ready to be over everything. He's not got the mentality of a prisoner just set free and doesn't know what to do with his freedom. He doesn't know how to 
take charge because he was a slave for so long? No, he's ready. He, he showed that kind of leadership in those positions and God's you know, put him through the training and now is using it. So that's what he's doing as he goes throughout the land. And we see in verse 48, so he gathered all the food of those seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and placed the food in the cities, okay? He provided granaries all over. It wasn't one big granary at the palace. He made granaries all over. He's putting his plan into action long before there is a need. And in fact, it says it very specifically here, uh, in verse 48 that in every city the food from its own surrounding fields so he surrounded every city and this would help with equality and later distribution the bigger cities had bigger granaries brought in more food they're going to be feeding more people than areas that were smaller so he was really organizing a comprehensive program he had an idea of how to conserve and he's putting that into motion he's setting up he's setting the stage for what he knows is coming because remember, seven great years were to be followed by the seven years of wanting. So verse 49, thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea. Wow, that's a lot of grain, folks. <laughs> Until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. I guess it went off the scale. God was applying, supplying in abundance during these seven years. Um, and it shows God's provision. It's interesting that archaeology backs it up, that they have monuments that show the contents of the granaries were all the way to the full mark, that they were full and overflowing. So even what they have found um, written by scribes or pictured by scribes backs up what the Word of God is telling us. Just an interesting side note. <laughs> okay, so what happens? Verse 50. Before, notice that, now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Yosef. Okay, he has the fruit of the union with his Gentile bride before the completed, uh, or it, it, sorry, let me say it right. The fruit of the union with his Gentile bride was completed before the time of famine. So he has his two sons that are born to him during the time of abundance, during the time of God's grace, before the time of famine. The body of Messiah, the body of Christ, the called out assembly, the church, will be completed before it goes into the time, well, I'm sorry, let me say it correctly. It will be completed and then will be the time of famine. The time of famine, the time of trial, the time of tribulation. But notice the fruit of the union comes first. It comes prior. It comes in this time. So what I'm saying is, as we become children in this age, age of grace, we're joint heirs with our Messiah, our Savior, we come into his family, is during the time of grace. The church age is going to end, the tribulation period is going to begin, the famine will begin. Okay, we see a separation there. Can I make a comment? Yes. So if you make that parallel, and I agree with it, um, and you say that right now is the time of abundance mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. that just tells you how horrible the tribulation is going to be. Yeah. Seven years of great famine. You know, people say this is hell on earth. No, no. Compared to what it's going to be, this, this is, is like nothing. This is earth. nothing. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to fathom that. When we think of something like the Holocaust, we think of something like October 7th. These are horrors, and I am not limiting yeah. the fact that they are horrors. What's coming out in the next few days, if you can watch it, I can't, but if you can, you will see horrific. But when you see that in the tribulation, all over the whole face of the earth, continually, and one on top of another on top of another, you're beginning to, to comprehend. I, I don't yeah, think we can. The Holocaust totally. was more of an isolated in a, in a geographic area, it yes. It wasn't worldwide. Exactly, and the tribulation is worldwide. And it's continual, and it's one thing on top of another. There, you know, we deal with an isolated episode, so to speak. So yes, yes, yeah. But wow, let's look at their names because it's significant, especially with this in mind too. In verse fifty-one, Yosef named the firstborn Manashe. You say Manasseh, but Manashe is our Hebrew, and that means forgetting. What's he forgetting? Let's read the verse and see what it's saying. For he said. 
God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. You may have all my toil, trouble, you know, whatever you have is there. Now, he's not saying, I forget my dad and I forget my family and I forget my loved ones. No, what he is saying is he is so blessed. There's so much abundance. He's forgetting the suffering he endured. He's forgetting the slavery. He's forgetting the, the fact that his brother sold him into slavery. That's where it started, but he's not remembering that. It's kind of like the mom and childbirth. She's going through childbirth, and if you ask her at that moment as she go through this again, she'll tell you no. <laughs> but how many moms stop at one? You know, they go back again because they forget. They have the joy that, the, of that child. They're willing to go through that again. So kind of a similarity there, but he's not forgetting his family. He's forgetting the bitterness. He's forgetting. He's not harboring any bitterness toward his brothers. We're going to see that very clearly in the next chapters. He's not harboring a bitterness toward God. How did you let this happen to me? I was even a good slave and you let me go into prison. No, none of that. And that's all being forgotten. He's moving forward with the blessings that God's given him that we see especially in the second name because now comes verse 52. He named the second Ephraim or Ephraim, Ephraim, however you say it. Ephraim. Ephraim, okay. Uh, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So he's saying, God's abundantly prospered me in this place that you sent me to be afflicted. You sent me to suffer. You know, they, when they sold him in slavery, they didn't expect him to have a good life. They really, we're going to see the brothers figured he was dead. You know, they thought he had died and rightfully so because slaves didn't live that long because of the way they were treated. So again, he's, he's showing his faith in God. He's looking at his blessings from God. He's showing he didn't forsake his heritage because he's giving them Hebrew names that have meaning and reflect the meaning with his God. And again, the fact that his wife is in this picture, having these children, not giving them Egyptian names, but giving them Hebrew names, honoring the God of Israel. Here's where I, I bring that point home, that it looks to me like she came into saving faith, that she was one who was brought in to know the God of Israel. And that to me is only fitting for one like Yosef. At that time, did wives even had a say so in the name? Well, we do see in the Hebrew culture, they certainly did. I can't speak for Egyptian culture because I haven't studied it, but in the Hebrew, we have um, um, Yudah naming his children, and it says clearly he named one, his wife named one. So we do see you know, that they did. So I can't carry that over into Egyptian culture. But uh, but knowing how God later is going to tell us in the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, for a believer not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, I don't think Yosef was an exception. I think she was one whose heart was tender and was touched and was brought in under her husband's leadership. So and according to uh, Potter's wife, he was good looking, broad shoulders, so I guess, you know. <laughs> I think his wife saw that beauty in him, too. He was handsome. And I think that even reflected his character with God. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Now, we've got a seven-year parallel here because we've talked already about the age of grace. We've talked about it being the body of um, Christ, the body of Messiah. We talked about how we're seeing seven years of famine for the seven-year tribulation. Let's go ahead and begin to read what happens there because verse 54 starts this for us. Um, 53 gives us the, the, declares the change over the seven years of plenty, which had been in the land of Egypt, came to an end. Okay, now the seven years of famine began to come just as Joseph had said. Remember, that's what he told Pharaoh in the dream. That's how it would happen. <clears throat> so here it is. Then there was famine in all the lands. If you have the word dearth, D-E-A-R-T-H, that's Old English, and it, it means famine. Uh, but for us, we know the famine is a type of the tribulation. It's a picture of God's judgment that follows the time of grace. Now, probably for Egypt, this was brought on by drought. And I find that interesting because in our age of grace, those of us who are in God's grace are being abundantly blessed. And we know that. But look what's happening in the world around us. It's becoming more and more like a drought when you talk about spiritual. Far more than I'm old enough now, I can say in my lifetime, I can see the difference. I'm not sure I'm happy saying that. I'm not happy saying it because of what I'm saying either, but you know what I mean. Anyway, so 
Um, I believe that we see a similarity there. Drought probably was starting to happen. We know that there was plenty of grain being brought in, so there was not a drought that was entire until the seventh year has been completed of the years of abundance. We won't see an entire drought. We won't see the Word of God and the, the power of God, the hand of God, the Holy Spirit working on this earth during the time of Age of Grace. He is here and He is at work. None of us will deny that. We want to see more, but we know it's still going on. But as we get toward the years of famine, toward the tribulation, I think we're beginning to see signs of drought. We're beginning to see where it's going. And this happened, as we read here in verse 54, um, that there was famine in all the lands. Okay, this was the whole, all of the world as they knew it, all the neighboring lands. Um, Probably, for whatever reason, they weren't getting the rains in the highlands, and the highlands would fill the waters. The, the water would come down, it would fill the Nile, the Nile would overflow, and the, the, where it would overflow, then that land would be very fertile. They would put their crops there, and they would, they would be blessed in that. Egypt itself only gets about an inch of rainfall a year. That's on a good year. That's all they get. So they have to be irrigated by the Nile, and if the Nile's not getting fed up, north above them coming down from central africa then they don't get that sediment they don't get that fertilizer and their land's going to be less productive so probably there was rain that was um less rain is what i'm trying to say the signs of drought coming and i would imagine year seven didn't produce as much as year one but they had already saved so much they were ready and it, and year seven was still a year of abundance it still was plenty because it, they had they had been fertilized the sediment had come now the change is coming in and we see in that change in verse 55, so when all the land of Egypt was famished, that's starvation, folks. That's not, oh, you know, I, I don't get my dessert today. That's hunger. When all the land was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, and he's going to tell them what to do. Now let me bring number 70 to us before we read what he's going to do. Yosef. Joseph, okay, he's the rejected Jew. His, his, his brothers have rejected him. He is going to be the dispenser of bread. He's going to dispense the bread of life to a perishing world. Okay, and so what, back up. what was 69 then? Dang it. I had 68. 69 is um, the two sons, the, the union of the Gentile bride before the famine, the body of Christ being completed before Jacob's trouble. Okay? Now, 70 is here, he's a type of Yeshua. In John 6, 51, Yochanan, John chapter 6 and verse 51, we have Yeshua declare it himself. It's a great chapter. What if the Bible isn't? But I mean it for this point. Um, chapter 6, verse 51, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Yeshua couldn't make it any clearer. He's the bread of heaven come down to a, a starving world to give them the bread of life. And that's what we're seeing in Yosef, a picture of Yeshua who is rejected by the nation. We know that, and we know Yosef was rejected by his brothers, but he is the one who's dispensing the bread of life to a famishing world, to a perishing world. So beautiful picture there, I think, for number 70. And now Pharaoh is going to tell them in verse 55, they're to go to Joseph. If they need food, they have to go to Joseph. We're going to see it started and stopped with Joseph. He was more than the gatekeeper. He was the bread keeper. He was the whole key. They didn't go do it on their own. He was the one. Everybody had to come to him. We'll talk about why in a moment. But as all must go to him for bread, all must go to Yeshua for the bread of life. Yeshua Jesus for the bread of life. Acts 4 and verse 12. To back up my point, Acts 4 and verse 12. And in Acts 4 and verse 12, we read, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name 
under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I don't think it can be any more clear than that. But let me back it up. Yochanan John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. And then let's look at Matthew, Matthew, Matthew 17, and verse 5. Matthew 17, and verse 5, <clears throat> excuse me, where we read, While he was still speaking, this is Yeshua, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God was telling them, listen to the Son. It's only through the Son. You've got to come through the Son. He was the one who had the bread. He was the one who is the bread. He's the one giving the bread of life. I should have told you to stay with Yochanan, John 6, because we're going to go back there. As I said, it's a good uh, chapter to bring out the points with the bread. We already read 51, but John, Yochanan 6, and verse 33. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. That's why the Father's saying, listen to my son, hear him. He's giving you the bread of life. He's, come, he's coming from the Father through the Son to all in the world. Verse 48, Yochanan, John 6, 48, Yeshua said it, I am the bread of life. Nobody can mistake that. He claimed it. And then verse 51 again, I'm the living bread come down out of heaven. Anyone who eats of this bread, he'll live forever. The bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. How do you live forever? By coming through his crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and eternal life that he has given us, blessed us with. So what a picture. Number 71, go to Yosef. And that will take us back to, okay, I shut my tablet, sorry. Back to Genesis 50, 41 and verse... 57, yes, no, no, 56. Did I even finish 55? Let's see. Um, Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Yosef, whatever he says to you, you shall do. And boy, I'll tell you, go to Yeshua Jesus, and whatever he says, that's what you do. Okay, now verse 56. I keep losing my place. There we go. When the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, then Yosef <clears throat> opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Okay, when you have the word earth, it's the same thing as the land. The famine was over the whole face of the land, the face of the earth, whichever word you have. Um, it, that means that it even went into Israel. It, it, because remember, it was neighboring countries. Egypt's below Israel on the map. I think we all know that. So it's all over. When it's all over, that's when Yosef opened up those storehouses that he had put all over. He was the superintendent of the granaries. Okay, and notice what he does. It says that he sold to the Egyptians. He didn't just do a handout. There was no freebie here. There's a number of good reasons for that. One, it, it's preventing looting and waste. They're only going to buy what they need. And they're not going to come thinking they can just grab and take and loot and it's a free-for-all. Yosef is going to make sure that supply is going to last seven years. He's not going to let them hoard and buy overbuy and eat it all up in the first year or couple of years. And then they're going to be in trouble. He's going to see to it that I'm going to say they're not going to go through more than a seventh every year. So that he knows it will make it to the end. If he'd done it any other way, it would have rewarded indolence, it would have rewarded short-sightedness, it would have rewarded people for doing nothing. And remember, as they could not be producing and, and having their way of life, they're not paying taxes into their government. So if they're not buying, the government would start to get in trouble. So he's seen to every level that it's all, life is going to go on and it's going to go on uh, with those having those needs being met. So yes, did he have a lot of wisdom? Yes, absolutely, God-given wisdom, and we see it in action. So he sold, um, and the famine is severe. Verse 57, the people of all the earth, notice it's not just the Egyptians, the people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Yosef because the famine was severe in all the earth. Three times we've been told in all the earth, I think, we get the point. It went beyond the borders of Egypt. And so Yosef, in essence, became like a savior 
to all the world. Okay, remember back up in verse 49, I think it was. Yeah, he stored up in great abundance until it was beyond measure. So he's the one really that's rescuing them, that's saving them, because had he not done that, they wouldn't have it. But he had unlimited resources to meet the need. He had brought in above measure even. And in fact, that's why I wanted to see 49. I wanted to bring it out. It says that he stopped measuring it for it was beyond measure. You couldn't measure it. There was so much abundance. Well, in this way, we have number 72 now because Yeshua gives to us out of his abundance that knows no end. Philippians 4 and verse 19, a very familiar verse to many of us, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Well, when is the last time that you've known Yeshua to become poor, to run out of his riches, or to not be able to meet your need? Never. Never. So again, Yosef is a picture of Yeshua giving out of his abundance, being able to supply and meet the needs. That's number 72. So eventually it's going to lead to the migration of Yaakov, of Jacob, and his family down into Egypt. I think we all know that, that that's what's coming in our story. And really that was one of God's ultimate purposes in these events. In Egypt for 400 years, they're going to live isolated. The Egyptians are not going to mix with them. We talked a little bit about this last week, that they, they, the shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptians, so they're not going to mix with them. What's happening to little Israel in the land of Canaan is she's been mixing with idolatrous peoples around her. And if God had allowed it to continue, she would have gone off into idolatry herself. But God keeps a remnant. He keeps those who are faithful to him. And as they go down to Egypt, and they can only mix with themselves, they're going to stay to their own ways. They're going to stay to the worship of the one true and living God. They're not going to mix with the Egyptian heathen cultures. They're not going to start worshiping the raw God's son. And they're going to be strengthened in their spiritual walk with the God of Israel. So in their need, God's strengthening them spiritually. That's what he does with us too. God wanted to get the Israelites away from the Canaanites and away from their influence, away from them being led astray, but he's not just going to send them off into another area where they'll be influenced by another people. That's why he sent them down to Egypt, because he knew in his plan this would keep them isolated. So we got great typology here to give you to, to look over this. Again, kind of like a review. Joseph was rejected by his brethren. He was delivered to the Gentiles who condemned him unjustly. He was cast into prison, type of the grave, delivered by a miracle from God, type of the resurrection. He's exalted to rule over Egypt, a type of the world. He's given a Gentile bride to reign with him, the church, and he delivers the world from worldwide famine. The tribulation okay he he and we'll see because the tribulation doesn't end humankind but he brings and especially Israel through that time and so number 73 I would say if you want a new one if you want a new number is this is a type of the continuation of the Spirit of God at work in the world when we looked at number 38 sorry verse 38 it was number 57 and I can take you back, it, it was where Pharaoh said of Yosef, there's a divine spirit in him. We've never seen this type of spirit in anyone. This is when he's raising him up to, to be in that second position. So he saw the supernatural wisdom, the insight in Yosef that was given to him by God. And here, what I'm saying is in God's divine wisdom, his spirit brings through this entire picture and will bring Israel through, but we also see that he brings the world into what will become the millennial kingdom, because other nations will go into this kingdom also. So we get a whole complete picture of, of Yeshua and his work through the life of Joseph. Is that not amazing? I see some puzzled looks. Where did I lose you all? <laughs> Questions? Comments? 
I'm looking at my puzzled people, <laughs> and I'm trying not to put anyone on the spot. I'm, I'm just taking it all in. I'm okay, wheels turning. And maybe that's wheels turning. Way. Maybe I so. Question, maybe so. But yeah. I don't know if it's not suitable for me to ask. Is there any meaning behind Ephraim and Manasseh in here that's a deeper meaning than what is just the good of the kids? Well, we saw the fruit of the union, and we saw yeah. that the fruit of Yeshua with a Gentile bride is us. You know, right. is he has, he has children. Um, more than that, I don't know. Keep keep your wheels turning. You come up with something, present it to us. We see it from Scripture. We'll say, yeah. yeah. But at this point, that's all I okay. I've seen in it. But again, you know, the Word of God, the depth is endless. So you may be going off to something to share with us. Okay? Okay. Over here? If this is so deep, it's like, oh my gosh. It's, it's a whole, we, we're getting a whole meal here. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I will agree. And that's why I kind of tied it up with a, a refreshing of that paragraph. And I'll admit for all of you, it's easier for me to see it than just to hear it. That's why I'm looking at my notes also because it, it helps me. Um, but let me take you into chapter 42 because it doesn't end. This, this life is so rich. The typology is so rich. I don't think I'll lose you. I think we can go on. But we can revisit this. I can go back over it. I can review it next week. Anything that helps because if you're like me, repetition helps. You know, I, I don't get it all the first time. I need it again. I need it again. I need it again. I'm not afraid to, to say that. Uh, but we're going to see as we move into chapters 42 through 45, this typology continues. God is going to deal with Israel again. And I want to shout that to the mountaintops because of replacement theology. And I just noticed I had a red flag. Rhonda, you had a question. My apologies. When I looked at the screen, there were no hands. <laughs> Jump in here before I, think, I start. I think I was just slightly overwhelmed with the list and I was jotting that was all rich and so could you just run through that again when you said sure. like Joseph was rejected and then Jesus was rejected and okay. delivered by could you just say sure. that one more time? Sure, sure. That that review and that's good for all of us. Joseph is rejected by his brethren. He's delivered to the Gentiles, you know, in slavery he goes to the Gentiles, they condemn him unjustly, he's thrown into the pit. Okay? He was cast into prison, and the prison was a type of the grave. He was delivered from that grave by a miracle, you know, by him being able to tell the, the dream and being at the right place that he told the other dreams that he could now tell Pharaoh his dream. So he's delivered from the pit by a miracle from God, and that's a picture of the resurrection, a type of the resurrection, which we know is miraculous, God resurrecting him from the dead. He is exalted to rule over Egypt, that's Joseph, you know, to rule over Egypt, but Egypt's a picture of the world. Yeshua is exalted, he will rule over the world. He's given a Gentile bride to reign with him. Right now he's gathering his bride. His bride it makes up one, but it's a, a, a greater number than one, you know, that, that is looked upon as one. When that bride body is complete, we know we're raptured, okay? Without getting off into that, though, we, we have that the Gentile bride is going to reign with him. When he returns to this earth, he will rule, and we will rule with him. He delivers the world from the worldwide tribulation. He says, if I didn't come back, there'd be no flesh left alive. That tribulation is pictured by the famine. Yosef is going to keep the world alive through famine. Yeshua keeps the world alive through the famine of the tribulation, comes back, puts a stop to it so that the world doesn't end. And that um, brings us, I think that's really the final point. Um, the, but no, 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 no. Then the final point will be, as was said of Yosef, that the Spirit of God was in him. The Spirit of God in Yeshua is what we'll see in his ruling and reigning in peace something this world has never known for a thousand years, and then going off into his eternal plan. I just made another connection while you said that a second time. Okay. So during the tribulation, if you would call it in Joseph's day, the famine, okay, the, the tribulation, famine. Mm -hmm. he was with the Gentiles, but that 
famine drew his own people. <laughs> yes, him. good point, and we will get that in the next chapter. Okay, so you were already perfect, but yeah, but I love. You're already thinking that. I am too. thinking yeah, okay. that too. Okay. You're yes, yes, and absolutely, it will draw the Jewish people back in to what should have been where they should have been. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was say, good though. Very good. Yes. My, my insight you're saying the second time too is that um, if we are the bride of Christ and we are just continue to shine now mm -hmm. in a time of plenty, um, since we'll be gone, um, his light, his joy, his peace, all that mm -hmm. to get as many Jewish people in now as well before. Amen. But God still has this plan, like you saw during the tribulation, right. to continue to draw them back, but we right. as many as we can now too by shining him. Right. We are his bride. Right. Excellent. Both of you. Excellent. Totally agree. Yes. Very good. Very good. Some of you are jumping into what is coming. And that's where I do start with chapter 42. We're going to see that God does deal with Israel again. He's, he's not rejected them for good. He's set them aside in essence. He's put the plan on hold. There are different ways we can say it. But replacement theology teaches it's over. It says that it's ended that God took everything that he had promised to the Jews and he gave that to the church. Now, it's very interesting. Those who tell to this never bring the curses along. They only bring the blessings along. They leave out the parts they don't like and say God's given the church the other parts. But yeah, it kind of shows that they don't really have a real good overall grasp yeah, of scripture if they're thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Because it's there. It's so clear, yes. And I think that's the problem is they take and they read in and they don't see God has a plan with Israel. So they read themselves in there and that's why they get themselves into all kinds of confusion and trouble too because if you start trying to follow that, you're going to have a lot of trouble with a lot of different scriptures that, you know, we'll look at some of them but not all of them but by any means. But it is during Yosef's rejection and his exaltation while he gets that Gentile bride, that his brothers have faded from view. We don't see Israel on that, in that limelight. And we don't today. This is the time of Gentile rule. <coughs> yes, our attention's drawn to Israel because of what's going on in Israel, but Israel's not in a position of leadership of this world. They're fighting for their own survival. They're fighting to be recognized as a state which they are and should have been recognized since 48 again because they were reborn again and now we've got another coming up that they want to give status to that is not a state it's just mind-blowing and overall but, the world agreed to that in 1948 yes and how, so, how soon everybody forgets that that was agreed on exactly so isn't it prophecy israel becomes a stumbling block of all the nations yes and that's what's happening right yes. now. yes right? good point yes <laughs> yes yes very good points yes Yes, but notice in the time of famine, the Jews come into prominent view again. And during the time of tribulation, it is centered in Israel. The world's attention is to Israel because that's where the world war will accumulate. Is that the right word? It's where they'll all converge. You know, on the Battle of Armageddon is in Megiddo, which is a, a place in Israel. It's actually throughout the land of Israel. We'll see it in the north, we'll see it in Megiddo, we even see it in the south from the description of Yeshua when he's coming through Bozra and, and so forth. But my point being is in Israel. Israel comes into that prominent view again. So yes, it is a picture of God dealing with Israel in the tribulation time. And he's dealing with them to bring them back in, to bring them into what he wants to bless them with. That time of famine, that's the tribulation, um, it's going to drive Yosef's brethren, the Jewish people, to Yosef for help. And remember what Yosef is a picture of, Savior, Yeshua, Jesus. So it's going to draw Israel to look to their Savior, Yeshua, Jesus. It is a time of punishment on the face of this earth, not just on Israel. On the face of this earth, God's wrath is poured out on the earth. It's, it's the cup of iniquity full, and God says, enough is enough. I'm going to start meeting out my justice, and we see that that's what happens during the tribulation. But during that time 
of the, the punishment on the face of this earth is preparing the Jewish people as they come through, and maybe I should say the Jewish nation, let me put it that way, as they come through the tribulation, he makes himself known to them. Now here's what I love, detail in scripture. The second time that the brothers are confronted by Yosef is when they will see who he is. And in the second coming of Yeshua, Israel sees who he is. But then, but they don't make it yet because they, they see it, but they didn't accept it. Right? Well, this is at that moment. Yeah. I'll take you to Zechariah 12:10. And let me read it for you so that I don't shorten it. Zechariah 12, 10, we see the triunity of God at work, uh, as has always been from the beginning, but in one verse we can see it. Zechariah, Zechariah 12, 10 says, um, I will pour out, God speaking, okay, God the Father, I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. He is pouring out his spirit. So now we have God the Father and we have the Ruach HaKodesh. We have two parts, okay? So that they will look on me whom they have pierced. When was God pierced? Crucifixion. Crucifixion. He was pierced in the body of Yeshua. Now we have the third part of our triune God in this verse. God's going to pour out his spirit, the Holy Spirit part two, and they're going to look at the one because the spirit is opening their eyes, the veil of blindness is being removed. They're going to see this one whom they have pierced, whom they crucified because they didn't accept him as Messiah. The world crucified him also, but we're, we're not, that's not our point here. In this, they're going to realize who he is because it says they're going to mourn for him. <gasps> what did we do? They're going to come to that that um, what to me is saving grace. They're coming to that point that they're realizing this was our son. This is our only son and they're going to weep bitterly because they're weeping over the firstborn. They're weeping over we rejected the firstborn. The firstborn is position, not that God had more children. It's the rank, it's the position, the same way that Yosef's second in position Yeshua is equal to God, but we're seeing him in his earthly form. God gave him the mission to do. He carried it out. Mm -hmm. That's what they're seeing. So in this one verse, and I believe this is at the end of the tribulation, they're going to realize, because Romans 11 says that all of Israel will be saved. That's not every individual Jewish person, but that's the nation of Israel. And what's he talking about there in Romans 11? And if you know Romans 9, 10, and 11, it's Israel past, present, and future. Um, one for each. 9 is past, 10 is present, 11 is future. And 11 talks about how the grafting in has been made complete. And in 1126, uh, yeah, I can start with 26. So all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. From Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. He's going to come from Israel. He's going to remove sin from Jacob. Jacob becomes named Israel. We know he's talking about the nation of Israel. This is my covenant, God speaking, Yeshua, Jesus speaking, with them when I take away their sins. So how is Israel going to have their sins taken away as a nation? They finally, as a nation, cry out and realize this is our Messiah. We missed him. We're mourning it, but we're realizing, and this will be the remnant that is saved at the end of the tribulation that will go into the millennium. So it's right there. You know, we're slicing time down to the minute detail. But this is where I believe it will happen, and that's what the tribulation was to do, was to bring them to that point so that they're ready to go into the millennium as a nation because now they've accepted their Messiah. So, and it also was to punish the wrath, I mean punish the sin with God's wrath, well deserved, on the earth, the whole earth. So his insight saying that what they just experienced in Holocaust in October 6th is going to be so much more worse, but the remnant will still come through. Right, exactly, wow. exactly. And that's why Yermia refers to it the time of Jacob's trouble, that's the name for the tribulation. And we know that God brings Israel through. He doesn't talk about bringing the church through. He talks about keeping the church out from the edge of, away from the edge of, Revelation 3.10, and many other verses. But we see that he brings Israel through. So if you want to replace Israel, 
and put the church in there. Now you've got the church going through the tribulation, and now you've got several other problems to deal with. Yeah. You know, opens up to confusion. Yeah, so the church is saved, but Israel has to go through it as well. To bring her through to her salvation as a nation. <coughs> Individual Jewish people, both times. Individual Gentiles, both times. In the and, age and of grace, in the tribulation. That, and you're ignoring that God said that that would be the people forever. Right. And you're ignoring that God gave promises, land promises to Israel forever. It's earthly promises. And the he, Bible explains the whole thing. Yeah. It explains it does. them. It does. Everything, everything we're going through right now, it explains It's it. right there. So it, it does. shows you don't know your Bible if you're doing this placement. <laughs> well, yeah. agreed. Yes. And Romans eight seventeen that we talked about just a few minutes ago, too, that we become heirs of Yeshua. He owns it all. We don't come into just land promises. We come into spiritual heavenly promises. Our citizenship is not in Israel. I'd love that now. <laughs> but for my eternal home, my citizenship is in heaven. Amen. You know, I'll get to come down to Israel. I'll, I'll take you on tours. As I put in my request to the Lord. I think he'll honor me. I'll take you on a tour in the millennium like you've never seen the land. <laughs> so, I think I like uh, Galilee. Oh, I love Galilee. Yes, isn't replacement theology a form of anti-Semitism? Yes, it is. Yes, because it is. Because then it just takes it Israel is. and Jewish people out of there and negates all their promises yeah. and treats them yes. like... Piranhas. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I believe it not only is anti-Semitism, but it opens the door to uh, allowing believers yeah. to think that anti-Semitism is, is uh, correct. What did you give me? Own... Goal for, for the Palestinian Authority? Yeah, go ahead and read that. Okay, he, the Palestinian Authority's foreign ministry asked the Kingdom of Jordan for the ownership registration documents for the houses in Jerusalem's uh, Shimon Hatzadik neighborhood, Sheikh Jarrah Yara, according to Israel's enemies, but turned out in a, a document from 1954 that the houses and properties are owned by the Jews. Okay, so they asked for something from Jordan to show that it, it's Palestinian and it proved it was Jewish. Yeah. 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 Israel bought that land too. Not only did God give Israel yeah. that land, but David bought the, from the Jebusites where the temple was built. That's the area that's in contention yeah. today. You know, we have many times, many occasions, we know Jeremiah was told buy a plot. He bought a plot yeah. in Israel. He didn't buy it in Egypt. He bought it in Israel. But, uh, but yes, and all of what you're saying is absolutely right, definitely. And, and Israel, the, those people are expert record keepers, and have always been. I mean, and they preserve scriptures. I mean, it, instead of replacing them, we should be really grateful. Because they, they because preserved our scriptures. for them, yeah. the Gentiles yeah. wouldn't have had a chance. And, and that's what Romans um, 9, 10, 11 bring out very clearly too, 11 especially, is that because the Jewish people stumbled, so not as to fall, they stumbled, <clears throat> but that opened the door for God to say, okay, I'm well, going to bring in this whole other people that you're not recognizing, they're going to be the mm -hmm. sheep from my other fold, I'm going to bring them in, I'm going to use them to provoke you to jealousy. Israel. Yeah, we should be grateful, but then we should pray for Israel. Yes, yeah, yes, right. yes. And again, Romans 11, don't boast against those original branches because if God was willing to move them aside to bring you in, he could just as easily move you aside, you know, so. Or easier because yes. you're grafted. A grafted branch isn't going to be as healthy. True. True. But it is interesting. At least in real life. In, yeah. In, in the olive tree, it is interesting that it goes against the normal that when a wild is grafted into an old olive tree, both are reinvigorated. I love that. By you Gentiles coming into the root, we're both reinvigorated. Yeah. Awesome. Isn't it? Isn't it? And that uh, now I'm not a horticulturist. I don't. I'm not that one person. <laughs> but I've studied and read, and that's what I've been told. So. Well, I was told that uh, Israel, uh, quite a few people are getting saved. Yes. Uh, thank they God are they are. Saved. Thank God they are. And Pastor Gill in the other room, myself. I think we're the only two Jewish ones around here. But we're proof that it happens in this day and age. 
-hmm. and it will happen you know it always has God has never cut off anyone from salvation number one no. and he's never cut off his people but it is interesting how we can see this parallel that does draw Israel back in and when you leave it in perspective then you do see the whole all of scripture just opens up and you realize God has one plan of salvation it's through Yeshua Jesus. We read that. There's no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved. It's only by the name Yeshua Jesus. And the whole world will finally bow to the name of Jesus. Heaven, earth, under the earth, everywhere will. But God does have a plan with Israel. God does have a plan with the called out assembly, with the church. There are two different plans. One way of salvation through both, but two different plans. But you get a double blessing because you're a Jewish person who came to Christ during the age of grace. So not only are you a friend of the groom, but you're the bridegroom, or I mean, you're the bride. So you get to be both, which is a real good blessing for you. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I can see what you're saying. Are always the chosen people. They always yeah. have that distinction. And what are they chosen for? To be a light to the world. Very good, very good. Not chosen because they were better. Deuteronomy 7 says, hey, you Jewish people, you're not the mighty ones. You're not the, wow, look at them. You're like, you're the runt. You're the puny. But when I take the puny, God speaking, and I show my power through the puny, who gets the glory? God. That's what they were chosen for. They were not chosen because they were better. They're not chosen that makes them better. They're chosen for a purpose, to share it with the world. Sadly, our Jewish people as a whole are not doing it today, but they finally will. Because in the millennium especially, the Gentiles will grab hold of the Jews to go up with the Jews to worship the God of the Jews sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and I will say it, comma, Israel. Not Palestine and not any other Amen. name. Israel. Amen. Yes. Because my God is faithful, <laughs> and my God keeps His word, even and I'll tell you that's the comfort. That. Even the world's history shows that it does. It shows faithfulness of God from the, the beginning. Not just history, but even the world's history shows mm -hmm. all that. You mm -hmm. can see that thread going all the way back to Bible mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you see the time of the Gentiles that God talked about the dream He gave Nebuchadnezzar, the gold, the silver, the bronze, all the way through. That's the Gentile world powers through time. We've had every single one down to the toes. We're waiting for the toes to be reestablished. That will happen during the tribulation time. Yeah, for the but, world to think that that Israel is done or whatever, anything they want to think, they're not. They're not. It's not their land. Whatever somebody wants to think. You have to ignore true history or rewrite it. Right. Correct. Because the history Correct. is literally that's, there. That's why yes. destroying, they continue to try to destroy books and stuff throughout the years, too. Yes. They have to yes. History. And the archaeological finds that I'm reading about constantly, that they just found a ring that uh, is showing them even that what they thought yeah. was the size of Jerusalem was larger and more prolific than they thought it was because of what they're finding now in that area. And, you know, even things like that, and they'll try to deny. Now, have there been the Arab people in that land for a long time? Yes. Yes, yes there have been. God, even when he brought the Israelites, the Israel, the, the well, he brought Avraham before there was an Israel. But when he brought them in, he said, you know, by the time you get down to when Moses is going to lead them right up and Joshua is going to lead them in, he says, there's seven nations in that land that I'm going to kick out and give to you because their evil is so bad that they're going to suffer my wrath and you're going to get the land that I'm putting my name on permanently because he says it's eternal. He says, I'll put my name here forever. That's where the change comes in. But yes, so there were. And in Israel today, are there Israeli Arabs? Yes. And there are Israeli Arabs in the Knesset. They have the right to vote. They have the right to, to live as an Israeli Jew is living, and they do. And many of them have made it very clear. If this two-state solution comes down and we find our house is on the Palestinian side, we're moving our house over to the Israel side because we'll fare better under Israel than we will under the Arab Definitely. leadership. Yeah, Definitely. for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and there are innocent Arab people who want peace with Israel, yeah. want to live in it. One of the kibbutzim that was hit so hard on October 7th, prior to it, and I heard her speak personally, <laughs> so this is not hearsay, 
she said that they're so close to the, the border, you know, they're, they're less than a mile from what becomes um, Gaza. And she said that they had partners on the other side and they were trying to raise the kids where they're hoping in the future these kids will be able to come together. So they did things like bike rides where they both rode on their own side of the fence, but they're riding together, you know, and they're showing a solidarity and wanting to come together and join hands. They were doing that before October 7th hit. They had to stop doing it because when they were putting up, they were videotaping and they were putting it up trying to promote peace the Arab people on the other side were being, quote, found out by those who were opposed and they were losing their lives or they were being tortured, they were suffering, so that they told Israel, don't show it because we're in danger because you're showing who it is. So they stopped showing it, but that's how much these people on both sides, Arab and Israeli, wanted peace together. It's not going to come to the Prince of Peace is here. They do, and they get killed for it yeah. in, in the Arab territories. So it, until Messiah returns, we won't find that, yeah. that peace. Yeah, because basically okay. Hamas is armed, and, the, and those people in Gaza aren't. And they, so you, so they pretty much have to Yes, over. and Golda Meir said it best. When the Arab loves their children more than they hate the Israelis, that's when we'll have peace. And that's the problem. And that's why you hear so many that are dying. Of course, those are not true statistics either. But, but uh, there are a majority of the innocent that are dying are Arab rather than Israeli. Because Israeli put their children all the way in the back and hide them where they're safe. And the terrorists, and notice I use that word, the terrorists, put the children and the mamas up front and use them as their shields. Yeah. It, it's, it's horrible. Or in any of the targeted areas that they Yes, the hospitals. Yeah. I just saw an ambulance. They show the ambulance. It's got Arabic writing all over it. It goes down the street. You think this is rushing somebody to the hospital for, you know, emergency. And when they open the doors, there are a bunch of young Kids. People, I'll use, I'll just say people, they're smiling, it's like they got the ride to school or they got the ride to the field trip or whatever and they're all just fine. But that propaganda went out that this was rushing those innocent that Israel had just hit, they were needing hospitalization and it was just all show. Because soon as one guy that was reaching to grab him said something, the kid went from, to, oh, start crying and crying, you know, like. Yeah, I didn't I'm even see that, that part. Yeah, I didn't see that part. Yeah, photo ops. <laughs> Let me close it off. We can go on with discussion, but there are those who need to go. I see the rumblings. Let me just say where we're coming, okay? So as we look into chapters 42 to 45, we're going to see God dealing with Israel again. We're going to see that during Yosef's rejection and exaltation, getting that Gentile bride, the brothers have faded to view. But then the time of famine, they come out in view. God's dealing with Israel again in the time of tribulation. We're going to see the famine driving the Jewish people to help this to you know to Yosef and of course a picture to Yeshua. That that's what the tribulation does in that second coming. The second time they come to Joseph, they see who he is. They'll grieve for that, and then he will bless, be able to bless them materially because Yosef's going to give food to Israel, and they're going to live near him. He's going to give them a good place in the land, and that's a picture of the millennium when God's giving them a good place in the land, and he's right there close by with them. So that's where we're headed. We'll look at that step by step as we go through the next chapters. We're going to see that, uh, that you know, he started ruling at 30. We've gone through seven years of famine, two years, uh, I'm sorry, seven years of plenty and two years of famine, which makes him about 39 by the time that this is going to be happening. So when he was sold off at 17 and it's, he's 39 now, we've got 20 years plus in here. Does that encourage anybody who says, when is God ever going to act in my life? When is the suffering going to end? What's the purpose in all this? We can see. God's timing is perfect. He is faithful. And whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're facing, take that as an encouragement. God knows exactly where you're at, exactly what the need is, and he has an answer. 
to bring you into blessing, not to have you end in despair. So I hope it encourages you. I'm excited to go on with this typology. I see you all love it as much as I do. We've got, you know, more coming. So come back and we'll keep going. But let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you because you are faithful. We thank you because you are true. We thank you that we can trust every word that you've given to us. And we do thank you for the Jewish people who you presented yourself to, who kept your scriptures, who passed them down that we might have them to study them today. We thank you for your plan for Israel. We thank you for your plan for the, the called out assembly, the church. And we thank you that nothing will derail either of these, that you have a perfect plan for all of creation and that your will will be done. We're just anxious, Lord. We want on the other side when not this whole earth, heaven, above and below, is all praising you, worshiping you, and honoring you. And may that be our joy forever and ever and ever, as you have promised. We know it will. So we praise you, and we thank you, and we look forward. But while we're here now, let us be those lights that draw the others to want to know you and to come to that saving faith, even through their time of famine. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory forever and ever in the holy name of Yeshua Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, I think we got a whole meal to chew on for a week. <laughs> I still have one.